and why it was cool for you. So just a, a, a volunteer from each table, and we'll, we'll, we'll award the table with the coolest, with the coolest, and I will be the judge, with the coolest Halloween costume. So let's start back over there. I remember okay. Toy Story. So Woody the Cowboy was my favorite. And so they had this whole video of the Disney and they had that but the belt buckle, the huge belt buckle, and every time you press it it said I'm shaking my boots. And so uh, <laughs> at five, that was cool. That was that's a cool one for a, we'll, we'll 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 weight these in terms of age and coolness here. So five What was the what was the cowboy's name again? Woody, Woody. All right, over here. Um, when I was probably between four and six, I was a bush for Halloween. A, a, a bush. What kind of a bush? I have no idea what species. <laughs> Just a green one. And five or six? Probably somewhere around in there. I don't know exactly. And what made it cool? You weren't, um, you weren't followed by dogs, were you? No, I was not. Excellent. Uh, all right, good. So Woody, a bush. What else over here? All right. In uh, fifth grade, I dressed up as Jango Fett because uh, Star Wars Episode Two. As what? Jango Fett from Star Wars. Oh, oh. Yep. And how? So, uh, I was fifth grade, so. so I have okay. that one. That works on being cool here. All right, then we're gonna move over here. With this table has got a cool Halloween. Oh, they're all looking at you, so you're stuck. <laughs> you're stuck here. I'm sorry. Uh, Will, yeah. what was your cool outfit? Uh, when I was about five or six, I was the Red Power Ranger, and I think I wore it for about two weeks straight. <laughs> <laughs> your mother was happy to get that in the laundry, I'm yeah. sure. <laughs> okay, great. All right, who's at this table? Uh oh, they're looking at you. So, Steven. Not me. On. Nope. Oh, well, they're, they're all looking at you. You're in trouble now. Uh, mine, I don't know if it was particularly cool. I was Batman from age 6 to age 13. Give us your Batman voice. No. <laughs> I am Batman. <laughs> Great. All right, this table here. Oh, come on. Don't be shy. Okay, you're stuck. They're looking at you. <laughs> Um, my freshman year in college, I was William Wallace from Braveheart and like dressed up with the face paint and the kilt and the sash and all that and memorized the speech actually, which was a lot of fun. Can you give us a few lines from that speech? <laughs> all right. Well, that's good. <laughs> well, as you get to be my age, you will remember even less. So don't worry about it all. This table, who's got a, oh, there, oh. Courtney, you better looking at you. I was Elvis for three years in a row. Um, I actually was oh, picture. picturing everything. People oh, thought I was. Mess. You're gonna have to see this. People thought I was a boy. Like they would be like, "Oh, hey, little boy," and I'm like, "Oh." Oh well, that's excellent. All right, over here. Who are you looking at? Okay. <laughs> uh, when I was in first or second grade, I was a blue Power Ranger, and I was real excited to wear it out, but. And I you know show it off to all my friends, and when we walked outside, I think every other kid on my neighborhood was also the blue Power Ranger. So <laughs> we got a red Power Ranger over there. So this is competition. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Well, that's fantastic. I think, you know, just just on the merit of it all, the only person who had a picture of it was Courtney here. So she's going to get the coolness award for today. Yay! What I like to do in terms of a prayer tonight is to teach you a simple little chant. And chant was one of the ways in which the faith was handed on so that, you know how sailors at port would learn different little kind of ditties? Well, some of the early hymns for the church were actually little chants set to the tunes that would be used. And so there's, in France, a monastery of uh, different Christian denominations. It's an ecumenical monastery called Taze. And they have a number of very calming and relaxing chants. And so this chant, I'm going to do my best to sing it. And those of you who are better than I in singing, help me out. So it goes like this. Jesus, remember me 
When you come into your kingdom, Jesus, remember me. When you come into your kingdom, continue. Jesus, remember me. When you come into your kingdom, Jesus, remember me. When you come into your kingdom, Jesus, remember me. When you come into your kingdom, Jesus, remember me. When you come into your kingdom. See how prayer and music can touch the soul and touch our hearts. If you open your binders to page 27, we have our opening prayer that we'll say together here. It's on the top of page 27. And I just want to point out this was written by a missionary in China in the 19th century, the middle of the 19th century. So you can appreciate how different generations, different periods of time, the way in which people's language about God or their prayers about God would have an impact. So let us read this together. Oh my Jesus, Savior. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. When you came in, you received two handouts. I want to have you look at the one that begins RCIA week six, and who is Jesus Christ. So what I first want to do for a little bit of time is to just do a review of the past weeks so that we kind of can refresh our memory. And you recall or you remember that next week we won't have a meeting because it's the Feast of All Saints, so we won't have uh, that session. But the very first week was just simply talking about an overview of what we were doing. And then we talked the second week about the rite of Christian initiation of adults and the theme of a journey of faith and the importance of that journey within. So I asked the question, do you think of the church as a person or as a place, and I want you to keep that question in mind in terms of when we think of what the church is. Do we think of it in person terms or in place terms? And then in week three, we dealt with the revelation, God's self-disclosure, and how that's been handed on through the centuries, how it's been recorded in the sacred scriptures, how it was handed on through living traditions, through the oral tradition, through speaking and sharing, from one community to another community, so the handing on of the tradition, but then how it was also preserved in an authoritative teaching, which we call the magisterium. Magister is simply a word that means master or master teacher. So when the church uses the word magisterial, it's a kind of master teaching. It's a way for us to take what's revealed in scriptures, what tradition has handed on, and how tradition helps us to know and understand the faith, as well as then how it's taught in the face of errors, of heresy. So the word we use for right teaching is orthodoxy, right teaching. So those three things, scripture, tradition, and magisterium, kind of create a triangle that are uh, sort of checks and balance on one another to help us come to a, a fuller understanding. The two little words that I'm adding in there that uh, are good for you to kind of just know about is what's the sense of the faith? But then there's also the question is, what's the sense of the faithful? So 
So the faith is handed on to us, but it's also a question of how we as the faithful embody what the sense of faith is all about. So those two words, the church, the magisterium needs to read what the census today is, the sense of the faith, but it also needs to see how throughout the world, all Christians, what's the common practice? What's an understanding that's universally shared? And that's where the church will talk about the sense of the faithful. That's why there always has to be a sense of dialogue. And then in week four, we took a look at the Bible. And the word that I put there is biblios, because Bible is always like a library. Remember all those different books that we saw, so it's a collection. But for us, it's a sense of the word of God. So it isn't Shakespeare. Although Shakespeare is a great work, his, his literature is a great work, there's a library of Shakespearean plays, and they're very inspiring, but the scriptures are a body of work that is a library of God's, God's revealed word. And so in that sense, we talk of the scriptures as the word of God. How that word is understood, how it comes to be handed on and shared, and so the term Dei Verbum, and during that class, we talked about the Hebrew scripture or the canon, what was defined in all those books of the Old Testament, and the Christian scriptures or the New Testament and what's defined. So when we look at the Bible, we're really dealing with a collection of writings that we've come to cherish as the divine inspired word of God. And so we talk about them as sacred scriptures. They're not just texts, they're not just short stories, but there's something about the mystery of the divine. And so even the word to think about them as the sacra pavina, the sacred pages, the sacred pages. So that the Bible for us is the kind of literature, but it isn't in the category of the way in which we would interpret other literature. It shapes us, it shapes us, okay? And then last week when we were dealing with the story of salvation, that common theme that we see is the free act of God in creation, the sense of human sin and error in our fall, and the story of God's redemption in our lives. So even though we can kind of see how the Bible talks about that in terms of Genesis and the creation and then the sin of Adam and Eve and the fall, and in the incarnation, the redemption, so too in each of our lives. We experience a sense of what it means to be called and created by God as a unique and loved individual, but then we know our own sinfulness, we know our own fall, our own need for mercy and forgiveness. And so in a certain sense, that story of salvation is something that is playing out for each one of us, as well as playing out throughout all of history. So each of our lives is a kind of echoing of that larger story of the creation of sin, mercy, forgiveness, redemption. So all of these things start to come together. And this evening, well, the other thing in there in terms of the gift of our life is that we are in the image and likeness of God. There is something divine going on in each one of us. And so that's part of the salvation story that continues to unfold. And the common thread in all of those stories throughout history, what we read in the Bible, is it's a story of a covenantial love, God's covenant of love. Whether it's with Noah, the kind of sinfulness, the fall of the corruption of humanity and God's judgment and the floods, but the covenant of God's rainbow, the covenant of promise never to again destroy, or the covenant with David, or the covenant with Israel, and in Christ the covenant of which we believe ourselves to be part of. So all of those stories are about God's calling us to conversion, to draw closer into a relationship to who and what God is. And so tonight what we're going to look at is, well, when we look at our resources, where is the clearest manifestation or presentation of that? Well, you kind of look at the life of this individual named Jesus of Nazareth and who Jesus is. And so that's why it's very important for us as we think about our faith journey is that 
God sent Christ Jesus into our world to show us the fullness of what our humanity means, to show us what the potential is. So that really we're called Christians <laughs> because our model is Christ, who this person is. So it's very important for each one of us then to begin to ask the question, who is Jesus Christ? Now years ago when I was duly ordained, 1981, I taught uh, contemporary Christian morality at Aquinas College in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And of course, you know, the first time you teach a course, you, you find out all the bugs, the things that you didn't, you didn't have going for you. And what I realized is for all those college students, when you would talk to them about Jesus and the example of Jesus and the significance of Jesus, in their mind they're thinking, yeah, Jesus is a superhero, but I ain't a superhero. <laughs> So they had this unreal kind of sense that Jesus didn't know what their humanity was about. So the next year I taught it, I had them also read a book, which is by Nikos Kazantzakis called The Last Temptation of Christ. And if you've never read that, it's really worth your reading. Because in that story, it goes through the life of Christ, but on the cross, on the cross is where the last temptation unfolds. And it is a depiction of Jesus as having not been crucified, as having said no to the will of the Father, and having married, and having a life and a family and all. So for the students, that was the first time that they started to think of what Jesus was like as a person to be tempted, to be challenged. And the beauty in Kazantzakis is that you find out at the words on the cross, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, that it was all a dream, that it was all tempting, and that wasn't who Christ was, but that was the last temptation of Christ. Now I tell you this because one of the students came back from spring break and he said, yeah, Father Mike, I was blown away. I read that book with my grandma and I was going crazy thinking that Jesus was tempted by these things, that he had attractions, that he had all these things, and my grandma was the one saying, well, why not? <laughs> why not? So one of the things for us to appreciate when we think about Jesus Christ is a sense of both the humanity of Christ, what his humanity means, and what his divinity means. That's the mystery, and why Jesus is unique in disclosing to us a way to God. So if you look at uh, the back of your binder, I want to do a little something with these texts that you have, which are your supplemental texts. So if you take a look at S23 to 25, what I just want to do before we get into the videos is to talk to you a little bit about, okay, who is Jesus and what do the scriptures tell us? What does the Bible say? And so you have this appendix, this supplemental material. So each of the lessons, it's good for you to kind of take a look and you can see what the Bible is saying. And then also you can see what the tradition says. So if you just look at the confession of Peter at Caesarea Philippi, and that's on the top of 24. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do men say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. So that understanding of Jesus being more than just a prophet, being the Son of the living God. So the scriptures are telling us that Jesus was a human being, but he was something more as well. And so in John's account, that rather lengthy section from 24 to 25, I won't read all of that, but notice what John does, is he puts Jesus in an understanding of the word, that Jesus is the word of God. And from the beginning, so what John does in the beginning of his gospel is the same way Genesis starts out. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. But in Jesus, in the beginning was the word. So you start to see that for the early church in the scriptures, who Jesus is stands out as a significant person other than any other kind of person. And then finally, if you turn to uh, Philippians on page S25 there, this is a beautiful hymn about 
G the early church understanding in the scriptures that Jesus, though he was in the form of God, didn't cling to that, but entered into our humanity. So you see the struggle that's going to be for us in understanding who Jesus is. How do we preserve a sense of his divinity and at the same time appreciate what his humanity is all about? Fully human and fully divine. So you see that in those readings, these scriptures, the tradition of the Bible itself lets us know that Jesus is significant. I printed out for you on the other handout a page from the Catechism of the Catholic Church. And for those of you who are in the Catechism program, they gave you a Bible, I mean a, a, a paperback of this, so those of you who are going through it, you have this and those citations that they give in terms of page uh, like 464 and all that. It isn't page numbers, but it's references. So on supplement on page 25, you see that there are three references to the Catechism of the Catholic Church. All I want to do is highlight for you, what does it say in the scriptures? So what the Catechism is doing is trying to take the scriptures and the tradition and bring those together. So here, when you take a look at what does the, what does the tradition tell us, this common theme that comes up, God became man, that man might become God. And so you see, if you look at the footnote for number 79, St. Irenaeus and 80, St. Athanasius. So these are people in the early centuries of the church, the third, fourth, fifth century. And then Thomas Aquinas in the 13th, 14th, 13th century. You know, that same thing. What was Jesus' mission? Jesus became one of us so that we might share in divinity. So that's the tradition handed on, and it's through centuries. So what happens then when we ask the question of the magisterium? What happens when people begin to put forth a false teaching, a confusing teaching, or they have questions about, well, yeah, he was human, but he wasn't really God. Or yeah, he was God, but he just pretended to be human. Those were all early heresies for the church. And so on the other side, when you take a look at um, the references there, heresies are false teachings. They can sound reasonable, and sometimes heresies sound truer than true, <laughs> but they misguide people. So that's why there needs to be a magisterium, a kind of teaching that helps us to guide our understanding. And so that's why one of the earliest things that the church did was to define the faith. So the articulation of the creed in 1325, the Creed of Nicaea. And so on Sundays, Christians profess that creed, at least Catholics and mainstream denominations. I believe in God. All of those articles of the creed were a way in which the believers came to say, we need a teaching. We need a teaching. And that creed is also called the Symbolon, which is the title of the series we're following. So again, for us to be able to appreciate that magisterium isn't just arbitrary. Magisterium is trying to preserve the integrity of what the faith means amid questions and doubts and uncertainties. So you can see then for Nicaea and Ephesus, the defining of who Jesus is in both the fullness of his humanity and the fullness of his divinity. Now, 464 on page 117 of the catechism that you have, I only gave you two early heresies. And one of the first heresies was the heresy of docetism, that he just appears to be God. And so you see for the early church, the apostolic times, from the apostolic times, the Christian faith has insisted on the true incarnation of God's son come in the flesh. God became flesh. So the divinity and the humanity and then another heresy, so the docetism was saying he didn't really become human. You know, he just appeared to be human. The other, another heresy, and in your catechism, you can take a look in the subsequent pages, kind of spell out all of these early heresies. But it's to help you see how the magisterium helps to guide a right understanding. So another early heresy was the Nestorian heresy, which, as it says, regarded Christ as a human person joined to the divine person of God. In other words, yeah, he was human, but he wasn't divine. God made him divine. God made him divine. 
And so the importance of the early church to say, if God didn't assume humanity, then humanity wasn't really redeemed. Only that which was assumed, the, the axiom was only that which is assumed is redeemed. So the early church struggled to try to understand this. Now I'm giving you that kind of background just so you can kind of see the scriptures, the Bible, also so that you know the supplement has really good resources for you to refer to. Okay, so that's the kind of background. So the way the Bible does it, the way in which the early tradition spoke about who Jesus was, and then finally, a question of how that teaching is handed on or what the magisterium is about. So we're going to watch the first part of the video, and you'll see how some of these things are echoed in uh, Dr. Siri's uh, presentation. Mainly, these questions for this whole video is Jesus, how is he human and divine? Jesus is mediator between man and God. Jesus, true God and true man. And then finally, Jesus' mission and ministry. So. All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go by my watch, which has already has, I think that's a little bit slow there. I just wanna give an opportunity, if, if you have any questions at this point before we go into the second half of, that, of the video. So any questions that you, you know, are from the first six weeks or to where we're at now, anything come to mind? I always like it when nobody has, you know. <laughs> so. Don't hesitate. Well, this is perfect. Then we can hand out those exams that I prepared. No, <laughs> since, since you know it all. Okay. Again, the only thing from the first part of this class that I want you to be aware of is those supplements are really helpful because they make you aware of what the Bible is saying, which is God's inspired word. And then you can also see how the traditions received it and the challenges to handing on that faith, to handing on the faith. So what we're going to do now is go into the video. So poor Maria, she's kind of doing double duty in terms of the recording side of this, as well as, as uh, this side. So. If you look at the handout at the very bottom when I was talking about these realities that the video is addressing, I, I just got some kind of points there. 
And really the fundamental question that anyone has to answer is just Jesus and who Jesus is. Because that's the question of faith. So for those of you who are engaged, for those of you who have found a person that you're willing to make the rest of your life with, or who are in marriage with, you come to know who that other person is. So this reality of knowing Jesus is an interpersonal relationship, and I think that's the kind of critical thing. And what we've come to know through history, through this sense of faith, that Jesus is not only an individual, the Jesus of history, let's say. So in the 19th century, the 1800s, so many archaeologists and scholars and historians were trying to find out about the historical Jesus. So what was it like in Galilee? What was it like? So we learned a lot of literature and understanding about who Jesus was as a person, what the day in and day out life of this man was. And that helps us to grow in an understanding of what his humanity was. But also, we profess Jesus Christ. And Christ isn't a last name. It's the title of the anointed one, the Messiah. So it's not only the Jesus of history that we come to know and understand, but it's also the Christ of faith. And so those two elements are strong in our answering, each person's answering the question, who is Jesus? And when we look at our human relationships, there's a similar kind of interpersonal mystery that takes place and unfolds. The struggle then for us as believers is if he's telling us in his own words that I am the way, the truth, the life, that I am the resurrection, how can we come to understand the truth of what he tells us as being human and as being divine? This is an entire area of theological research called Christology, the study of who Christ is. You can, there are volumes and volumes on this question of understanding who Christ is. But in your life, in your faith journey, in this pilgrimage, it's a sense of you, in an interpersonal way, coming to know who this person Jesus is as the fullness of humanity and the fullness of divinity. Because in knowing that kind of a person, and knowing that person, they help us realize who we are, who I am, in the fullness of what my humanity is, and the possibility of what God's divinity means for me. So those elements come together. So you see how, too, in the video, then, Jesus is this bridge, this mediator, between each of our human stories, each of our own kind of personal journeys, a sense of what our humanity means. And again, a whole field of study on that is Christian anthropology. What does it mean for us to be human, to be truly and fully human? But that Jesus is that bridge, that mediator between humanity and the mystery of who and what God is. So Jesus didn't just come to give a bunch of good lessons to teach something really great. Jesus came to change us, to draw us into the fullness of what we're possible to be, and to discover that. So that the revelation in Jesus, when we stop and think about it, is really an opportunity for each one of us to discover what the fullness of our own humanity means. Because to the degree that each one of us lives fully the humanity that God has called us to, to that degree we participate in the divinity of God. God became human so that humanity might shed the shackles of sin and error and know who we fully and truly are. So when we talk about doing the will of God, doing the will of the Father, God's will is for our happiness. You know, it's a wrong way of thinking to think that Jesus came to make us miserable. Oh, I'm a Christian. I'm really, really happy. You know, wonderful. G.K. Chesterton says the greatest outward sign of a Christian ought to be joy. And so you can begin to see and realize that this mission of Jesus, what Jesus is showing us, is the true character of God, but also the true character of us, of who we are. 
It's almost as though Jesus reaches into the very depth of your being and says, this is the beloved. You are the one. And I want to call that out from you because that, that is what the flourishing, that is what your destiny is all about. So we start to see that this Jesus isn't just some character from the past. Jesus has entered into the depths of who we are, that personal relationship that draws us to a sense of knowing the truth, the honest truth of who we are. You know, the people who love us, love us not because we're perfect. They love us because they see the good in us. They see the good and they're able to help draw forth that good. And that's the mystery of what God is all about. And in Jesus Christ, we come to know that. So ultimately then, as we reflect about Jesus throughout history, it's a story of how humanity has come to know who this person, Jesus, of history and the Christ of faith are all about. And in that, what we'll see and what we'll talk about is both the mission, what, why was Jesus sent? Why was Jesus sent? What was his mission and his ministry? How is that mission fulfilled? And we see time and time again in the scriptures and throughout history that the mystery of what that mission is about is healing, mercy, God's reconciliation. So you suddenly see that Jesus, the disclosure, the revelation of God that's been handed on through scriptures and tradition is something that isn't in the pages of history, but is a reality that is living and present in those who are gathered around his name. Gathered around his name. The Greek word to be gathered is ecclesia, which is the word that we use for ecclesia, which is church. So we begin to see and appreciate the mystery of what it means to be church is to be gathered around the reality of who this person is. And so to the degree that all of us who bear the name Christian are true, are true to this person of Jesus Christ, Christ dwells and is made manifest. And so we are the ones then in terms of our journey and in our struggle who have to deal with our shortcomings, where we miss the mark. Now, any of you who are in a relationship in terms of loving somebody, you know, that fight, that first fight that you have with a good friend or with the person you're marrying or the person you're married to is that moment where you really kind of say to yourself, do I love them even when we disagree? Because you come to realize that love isn't so much about agreeing on things but love is really about understanding one another. And so for us then in terms of this incarnation, the mystery of who Jesus is, is an opportunity and time for all of us who bear the name Christian to start to discover there is a mission and a ministry of God's redemptive healing that takes place in our world here and now. And you know what's remarkable? Each one of us has been invited to be part of that. When we pray the Our Father and we say, thy will be done, the will of God isn't a hard thing to do. The will of God is not a hard thing to do. It's the most natural thing because it's what God really wants of us and it's where we find our happiness. Doing the will of the God, doing the will of the Father, we make it difficult. We're the ones that put the complication in the way. We're the ones that have a false sense of what that happiness is about. So you can kind of see that when we look at this question of Jesus, that it's something so much deeper and richer than just a person in the past or just some superhero, but it's the reality of you. Who do you say that he is? Who is that word speaking in your heart and in your lives. So, one of the things for next week that we're not going to have a class on is because Tuesday of next week is November 1st. And in you know, the Catholic Church's tradition of reckoning time, days and seasons have meaning. 
And so the church has always held throughout the, no season, the month of November as a time to reverence and remember our deceased, our, de our loved ones, so those who have gone before us. So November 1st is the Feast of All Saints, those whom we believe know the fullness of what the kingdom of God is about. And on November 2nd, it's all souls, those who are still journeying to come to know what the fullness of the kingdom is. But one of the things about saints, and when we stop and think about saints, the tradition in terms of Christianity has often been when a person became, was baptized, or when a person's confirmed, they choose the name of a saint to help guide them or to kind of be an inspiration. So Tuesday, which is a free day for you though, masses are being offered at 12, 10, 5.30 and 9.30, so it's a chance to go in prayer. It's also a chance for you to think about a couple of things. Think about your Christian name, what your Christian name may be, whether it's a first name or a middle name. Ask yourself, why was I given that name? What does that mean? And then start to explore who are the saints that are speaking to you in their story and what their life is. On the formed.org website, how many of you, by the way, have had a chance to kind of sign up? This is embarrassment time. Put your hands up. I appreciate your honesty. Sign up. Sign up. Form.org. If you don't have the access code for the parish, we'll be able to give it to you. But right on the home page, Jan told me, right on the home page are really great resources on the lives of the saints, coming to know the different kinds of saints. And the way in which the story of a saint, who this person is in their journey to come and know God, helps us to grow in our understanding of what our own faith means and what our own faith journey is. So, any questions? Uh, perfect. Last I heard, the uh, Indians were ahead. Is that right? So, being a Cards fan, I'm kind of happy with that. So, but love all you Cubs fans who might be there, but don't necessarily want the Cubs to win. So, excellent. So, we'll see you in two weeks' time. Please take advantage of signing up for that form.org. It's a really great resource. Also, just in the future, pay attention to the supplemental sections because that's good resources to, to be aware of. And for those of you who did get one of the catechisms, page through it. Kind of start discovering some of the things that are in there so you know what kind of a, a library you have in that because that embodies the tradition and it embodies the teaching. Okay, excellent. Let's close with a prayer. And if you turn to page 31... This is a, a beautiful prayer from probably one of the most willful people when he was young, Ignatius of Loyola. He was very ambitious, very kind of vain, but he underwent this conversion experience. He was a soldier, he was injured, and in his recuperation he had this conversion experience. So this prayer of handing his life over to God, I think is a beautiful prayer. And that's a Dominican saying something good about a Jesuit. So that's something unusual. So, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Take, O Lord, and receive my life. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Go home, watch the rest of the game if you're interested in that, and we'll see you in two weeks' time. Mass on, t on Tuesday for All Saints Day is 12.10, 5.30, and 9.30 here, or at the other parishes as well. Great. God bless.